Welcome to Solo, the single person's guide to a remarkable life. Your host, a behavioral scientist and bachelor, talks to leading experts and successful singles about living solo and living well. Travel more, make things, sleep in when you want to. Here's the playbook for the person who is unapologetically unattached. Now, please welcome Dr. Peter McGraw. In this episode, I sit down with the world's expert on the science of single living. We spend a lot of time myth-busting singled and married life. For example, we discuss the myth that marriage causes people to be happier. It doesn't. We talk about the myth that single people are lonely. They're actually more socially connected. She shows you the way that single people are stigmatized, stereotyped, and discriminated against. On the flip side, we discuss the benefits of being single, such as the freedom to pursue things that you really want to pursue, the ability to take chances, and the opportunity for growth. Finally, we talk about some resources for single people, some of which you can find in the exhibits. There's no bonus material this week, but there will be some in future episodes. Let's get started. Welcome to Solo, the single person's guide to a remarkable life. I'm Peter McGraw. Today's guest is Bella DiPaolo. A Harvard PhD, Bella is the world's leading researcher on living single. She's the author of Singled Out, How Singles Are Stereotyped, Stigmatized, and Ignored, and Still Live Happily Ever After. She's also the author of many, many other books. Her TEDx talk, What No One Ever Told You About People Who Are Single, has been viewed over 900,000 times, more than my TEDx talk. She has been writing the Living Single blog on Psychology Today for over a decade. And I think all of this explains why I'm so eager to speak to her. <laughs> Welcome, Bella. Thanks for having me. I'm glad you have this this podcast. Yes, it's brand new. Great. Yeah. So, I mean, I think it's fitting for such an early episode to feature you. Thank you. Um, I am... Um, I'm going to tell you how I came across your work. So I okay. actually knew of your work when you were at the University of Virginia on lie detection, right. which we might talk about at, at some point. And so I came across you when I was an aspiring, aspiring to be a graduate student. Okay. I was actually telling, telling Bella off, offline that I had applied to Virginia and I had mentioned in my letter that I had wanted to work with her. Oh. <laughs> and so, um, so it, it's, it's through happenstance yeah. that I find, well, find I, myself here today. I wasn't doing my singles work then. So you're, you did better. You I, ended up, we both ended up in the same place. By way of about single people. Yeah. By, by yeah. very different means. Yeah. So I, the, how I got to know you was I remember a study. I think it's a study that you did, which I just love the cleverness of it. And I think we should just launch right into okay, it with that. Ahead. And, and you can, you can correct my, okay. my bad science. Right. So nearly everyone, except the folks who have done the work like you yeah. or read your work, think that married people are happier than single people. And they ascribe a causal mechanism yes. to this. That is that that there is a boost in happiness that comes from right. being married. That's what they think. And the reason they do that is that they compare the happiness of single people to the happiness of um, married people to the happiness of divorced people. Right. And the happy the the happiest people are married. The least happy people are divorced, and the uh -huh. single people sit in between. Right. Yes. Typically, yes. And what you did was you go, because you're a well-trained scientist, <laughs> right. you say, well, let's look at the data the way we ought to look at the right. data. And I'm going to now hand it over to yes. you to describe yes, the findings. Yes. Well, what people like to say, including fully grown scientists who should know better, what they like to say when they see studies like that is, oh, marriage wins. Get married and you will be happier too. Well, the right study to do to test this is to follow the same people over the course of their lives to see if the same people get ha get married, they get happier. And what you find is if you follow the same people and you ask them every year, how happy are you? How happy mm -hmm. are you? How happy are you? When they get married, they get a little bit happier but then they go back to being as happy or as unhappy as they were when they were single. And that 
only happens if you get married and stay, stay married. married. <laughs> <laughs> if you get married and get divorced, you will see that those people were already getting a little less and less happy as the day of their wedding approached. <laughs> So they didn't even get that little um, honeymoon effect that people who stay married get, where they get a little bit happier, you know, they have the wedding and the big party and it's all very exciting. And then they go back to, you know, whatever. Yeah. So I, I, as a, um, as a single person, as a bachelor, I found a lot of meaning in that. And that gave me ammunition in my conversations with people who said, Pete, I'm really worried about you. (laughs) Right, right. Like right. I'm worried, I'm worried. You know that you're not, you know, yeah. the, your incompleteness. Right. And, so and imagine if you flipped that and said, "I'm really worried about you, my married friend. When are you going to get divorced? <laughs> and how how, how just, devastating is it going yeah, to be? Yeah, yeah. And you know, <laughs> you're just so dependent. And you know, I as a single person, you know, I I have freedom and dep- and independence. I can do all the different things that married people divvy up and i'm just so worried about you <laughs> it's true I, uh, I i have a little story of a, a woman who i met who you know on date number one actually even before we went on a date i told her you know yeah. I'm, I'm not interested in being yeah. married with children and she's like i, I really want to talk to you about that i want to find huh. out why you, you okay. want to do that and so we met for brunch one day yeah. and so she you know kind of yeah. went, so why don't you want to be married and i said well, i'm i'm happy to answer this question yeah. i just want to point out Imagine if I sat down to you and I said, I just want to understand why you want to be married. Yes, exactly. Will you convince me why you're, right. why you're making this, this yes. correct choice? Yes. And that is one of the most important things that I have to suggest to single people who feel put upon or made defensive, feel defensive yeah. um, in all these different ways. Flip the script, mm. just like you did. Okay, you want to understand why I'm not married and I don't want to have kids? Well, I want to understand why you do. Yes. And I think it's a very powerful thing. In fact, um, when I wrote Singled Out, the book that you mentioned. So she's flipping um, through it at the right, moment. Right, 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 right. I didn't decide until I finished the entire book how to start it. Oh, really? Wow. And so I wrote the first page last, and I said that I could imagine a world in which married people were not treated appropriately, and if that world ever materialized, I would protest. Here are a few examples of what I find offensive. When you tell people you are married, they tilt their heads and say things like, aww, or don't worry, honey, your turn to divorce will come. (laughs) When you browse the bookstores, you see shelves bursting with titles such as, if I'm so wonderful, why am I still married? (laughs) And how to ditch your husband after age 35 using what I learned at Harvard Business School. Every time you get married, you feel obligated to give expensive presents to single people. When you travel with your spouse, you each have to pay more than when you travel alone. At work, the single people just assume that you can cover the holidays and all the inconvenient assignments. They figure that as a married person, you don't have anything better. You're going to be around. I won't keep going, but it goes on like that for a while. And it's, it's again, a way of taking all the kind of insults and that get thrown at single people and mm-hmm. just flip them. And it's and the important thing is it's not just things that are kind of insulting. It, it isn't just, you know, making us feel bad. It's real serious examples of discrimination, mm-hmm. such as laws and policies <clears throat> that benefit you only if you're legally married. Yeah, when I started this when I started this um <clears throat> project i i was originally i was looking at it more for just men Mm -hmm. for bachelors and i was doing a bunch of reading like there's actually through history bachelor taxes yes that existed that if you were a single man of a certain age you had to pay the government you know there was even amazing incentives where where you know, it was nice to have single men out on the as pioneers, mm-hmm. right? Out on yeah, the leading right. edges. Yeah. Um, but once once everything yeah. was uh, settled, yeah. Let's you know, let's get you hitched. Right. 
So let's let's step back a little bit. So there's a whole bunch of things I want to do with right, this because okay. I think that that giving single people ammunition uh-huh. by not only to to be able to talk about right. about these myths mm-hmm. with the people who perpetuate them, but also to feel comfortable with either a decision that mm-hmm. they're in or this idea that I I like this idea that. That, you know, as you've pointed out, the average person nowadays spends more of their life single right. than they do married. Yes. And I chafe at the idea that being single is a liminal state, mm-hmm. that it's considered yes. this sort of temporary transitional Just state. Just time. Exactly. Mm-hmm. That you're incomplete until this happens. So, mm-hmm. so let's step back for a moment. So you were at the University of Virginia. You right. were doing work on lie detection. Yeah. And I, if I remember correctly, the, the, most of the work you, you showed is that we're not as good at lie detection as we think we are. Right. Yes. So, um, in fact, I did a review paper with Charlie Bond and we reviewed over 200 studies. And we found that on the average, people are correct about whether someone is lying or not. 54% of the time Mm -hmm. when by chance they would be right. 54% of the time. 50%. 50%. Okay. I mean, I think of you as being at the leading edge. Yeah. Frankly, too early. Yeah. In oh, some ways, okay. yeah. of what's I think starting to happen now, yes, which is, and you must notice it more right. than Absolutely. even me, which Absolutely. is suddenly there's a, or not so suddenly, yeah. but there's starting to be more conversation, right, around that maybe marriage and family isn't all it's cracked up to be, right, and I think some of that has come out of a lot of the work on well being uh-huh. that has that um yes. that a lot of kind of behavioral economists and right. so on have done. And then also this idea of like, oh, well, you know, we yeah. can, single people can live rich lives. Yes. But you were way early. And yes. where did this come from? <laughs> well, um, I've always been single and I'm 66, so it's a long time. And there was a time when I thought, well, maybe marriage is like a bug and you get bitten and I just haven't gotten bitten yet. Mm. Um, and at some point, I don't remember when, I realized, no self, you are never going to want this. Single is who you really mm-hmm. are. And that was such a revelation and it was You were in your so 40s important. at the time? I don't remember when. I think okay. it was earlier than that. But, okay. um, and I realized I like being single. Mm-hmm. And yet, all around me, there were still these headlines, even back then in the paper, you know, oh, you get married, you'll be happier, you'll be healthier, you'll live longer, mm-hmm. which are still around. Um, and I had no reason not to believe that until I decided to um, write a book and look into it. But that, so that was part of it was, I didn't. But what, 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 like what? There's, there seems like, where's the, that idea of like, I'm going to write a book about this. Okay. I'm going to investigate. Yeah. There's it. another part of okay. that. Okay. Okay. Uh, which came first, which is noticing that it seemed like in some ways I was treated as lesser than because I was single. Mm-hmm. So, um, if we had a job candidate coming and somebody needed to entertain the job candidate, they'd say, oh, why don't you take it? Mm. Because the married people, you know, they have to go home mm-hmm. and have dinner with their spouse or whatever. And um, I was asked to teach the night classes again for the same reason. Or this was one of my favorites. It's such a little thing, but it drove me nuts. Um, at our department, we used to have a psychology department picnic. Mm-hmm. And every faculty member would contribute $10. And then they could bring their whole family. I see. So for ten dollars, I brought myself and the department chair, who was probably making more money than anybody else, brought himself and his wife and four kids. I see. You know. Yes. And so at the time, oh, and you know, and if you go to somebody, if you travel and go to somebody else's house, if you're single, they might put you in the on the couch in the living room instead of a bedroom with a door they shut. You know, <laughs> or if you socialize with your with friends who are married. Um, they might socialize with other couples on the weekends, movies, dinner, mm-hmm. but with their single friends, you know, you're demoted to Tuesday lunch night. Or, or, you know, <laughs> children's birthday parties I and see. stuff like that. So when I first started thinking about this, I wasn't sure if 
is this just me or is mm. this something more general about single people? Mm -hmm. So I started approaching people very tentatively at first, people I knew who were single. And I said, do you ever think you're treated differently because you're single? Mm -hmm. Oh, my gosh. So the first time I did this, I just approached one person and she started telling me her stories. Then somebody else joined us, and he started telling his stories, and then somebody else joined us. We talked the rest of the evening at that social event. The next morning, I turned on my email, and I had all these messages from the same people saying, oh, and another thing. Uh, I see. Interesting. <laughs> so then, about a month later, I got invited to give a talk at Yale. It was about my deception work. And afterwards, they had this reception for me. And so I did the same thing. I approached someone who I knew was single and asked, have you ever had this experience? Mm -hmm. And the same thing unfolded. One person after another wanted to tell me about the ways they thought they were being treated as, you know, not fully adult or not fully first-rate citizens because mm -hmm. they were single. Yeah. So that's when I realized this is hitting a nerve. I really, this needs to go beyond academe. And that's when I wanted to write my book and I wrote. I it see. But once I decided to write a book and I was an academic, so then I had to take on, well, what about all these studies that supposedly say mm -hmm. that if you get married, you'll be happier and healthier. And I had no reason not to believe them. You know, I was a single person. It's a compelling narrative. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And I, you know, I just figured I was I've read like, Jane Austen. Yeah. <laughs> so I just figured, I, so I decided as a social science trained, social scientist trained in research, I used mm -hmm. to teach uh, graduate courses in research methodology. So I know about how to do research and how to interpret it. So I was hoping to find some little you know, some little, little exception. Yeah, like moderate. Maybe. So, yeah. So in our world, so forgive, yeah. forgive us for a moment. Yeah, in yeah. our, we're looking for what we call moderator. Yes. A sort of an exactly. exception. Right. They, when this condition yeah. is present, the, yeah. uh, the effect is the reverse. Yeah. So maybe for rich women, yes, you know, they, right. they do better or something. Yeah, yeah. And that's when I looked at the research and was so stunned to find that these studies could never support this conclusion mm -hmm. that first of all like you said you know they separate the people who are currently married and they say oh the currently married people do better than um, the other people so you should get married but what they're doing is taking out of the married group the nearly 50 percent it's about 43 percent uh -huh. who get divorced yes and then they're less happy they're less healthy and it's like they want to take that and set it aside and say that doesn't count. <laughs> you know? Yeah, which is you know which is something that scientists do because they want to publish papers that say what they want them yes, to say right. rather than what right. the data often say. And that is called cheating. <laughs> <laughs> it is indeed. Yes. Um, so let's uh, so so okay now how was this turn this change in yeah. focus met? professionally because ah, you know okay. i by the way i had yeah. the same thing yeah. when i stumbled on the question of what makes things funny right and i oh and okay i had come to it yeah. with 10 years of experience studying studying emotions right. and okay. i had a fresh perspective mm -hmm. and i was able to look at years of data yeah, and yeah. thousands of years of theorizing uh -huh. yeah see the problems uh-huh yeah and, you know i had right. one advantage yeah. right. you know which is i could run these experiments yes and, yes. um, and, you know, I was able yeah. to create some new insights, but, th you know, I would say that topic was met at best with some skepticism yeah. as a choice right. by right. colleagues. Yes. I had a student who also wanted to pursue that and he ran into the same thing. You know, mm -hmm. it was hard for people to take it seriously Be yeah. Yeah. because it's not a serious topic. It's not right. seen yet. Yet it's very important. So, right. so when you made this pivot, what um, happened? I basically had to go off on my own. So I 
came out to Santa Barbara in the year 2000 for what I thought was going to be a one-year sabbatical. Mm -hmm. And I never went back. And there are a lot of reasons for that, including how incredibly, spectacularly beautiful it is out here. We're, we're sitting in your living room in Summerlin. Yes. And it's an idyllic, <laughs> beautiful... the ocean. It's yeah. just so, so amazing. I've been here 19 years now, and every single day I wake up and I can't believe how lucky I am. To be here. So you left academia. Well, I didn't think I was going to, but um, I, I was just on a one-year sabbatical. Mm -hmm. But during that one year, the year 2000, that's when I started rethinking everything. So I had this very established area of expertise yes. in the psychology of lying and detecting lies. Um, but my heart was in this work on singles. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I started it, actually... I started this secret file, a, a, a file folder, not even on a computer. It was one that you can hold in your hand, you know, those old Manila ones. Yes, I still have them. Yeah, yes. right. And I wrote the number one on it. That was going to be my study of singles. And I think the first thing I slipped into that file was from the year 1992. And it was a column, an advice column, okay. where the advice person said included the quote one is a whole number ah and so that was my first entry into my um then secret study you know of single life I, it's so interesting you say this so yeah so this podcast yes. this project so right. obviously so the podcast is only part of what's going to be a bigger project right. Details to come. Yay. <laughs> I I have been yeah. calling my secret project. Oh, that's great. It's, yeah. I've been having so much fun telling right. people that I'm working on the secret project. Yes. And I've yes. only let the you know, either right. people who I'm very close with know right. or people who I who this idea has yeah. come up with. Right. And so right. at some point I'll this will have yeah. come out. Right. I've launched the right. secret project. I think that's that's funny that right. you that you were yeah. treating it in the same way. Yeah. So when I was on sabbatical, that's when I decided, you know, this is what I really care about. Mm. This is what I want to do. And so at the same time, I decided I never wanted to leave mm -hmm. the West Coast because it was so beautiful out here. Um, but to apply for jobs in academia as someone who whose main area of interest was now single life, mm -hmm. having no credentials, I hadn't published a study yet. Um, see, you know, yes. I had started doing my own research and writing, but nothing was out there yet. Mm -hmm. um, you know, except for things in non-academic places. I, you know, I applied to one job. That's it, and and did not get it. And I was told, well, if you want to instead reapply and talk about being a deception researcher We'd that would be you. a whole different thing which i did i said you know no <laughs> this is what i care about mm -hmm. and and it was it was a little disconcerting at the time but i am so happy now because it's very freeing to be able to you know, do whatever you want, say whatever you want. Yes. Um, and just pursue the life that I care about. And, you know, the, the one big thing I don't have is that regular salary. And that was really nice to have. Yes, and I sort of have to put things together on my own, you know, pick up courses to teach here and there or, you know, my blogging or my writing or sometimes I get some consulting and it's a whole different, less secure thing than knowing that you have that regular paycheck, paycheck coming come hell or high water so but that is the only thing that i regret about you know not having my academic job anymore and i, I loved it i mean i loved academia i like the whole you know i love i love intellectual life yes so it wasn't something that i'm not putting it down i'm just saying it's also freeing to be able to have the life of the mind without the committee meetings. <laughs> Indeed, I was about to say, you know, uh, so my take yeah. on this, and then we'll, we're going to jump into some some myths about marital yeah. bliss. But the um, my take on this is, if you talk if you talk to an academic, what they'll say is best job in the world, yeah. it's the best job in the world. But if you listen to an academic, uh huh, uh huh, <laughs> you realize that they they for that steady paycheck, they do a lot of things that they don't right, find to be pleasant. Right. And as one of my colleagues used to say, you can work any eighty hours you want. 
Yes, that's right. <laughs> yeah. And so this has made you obviously more, much more entrepreneurial. I was, yeah. I was looking yeah. at your website and I was right. just amazed by your how prolific you oh, are yeah. as a writer. And when you don't have to do committee meetings right. and faculty meetings, yeah. you can dedicate more time to your creative exactly. work. Exactly. So I, I have to point this out. It's probably obvious to the listener and to you, but you being single yeah. allowed you to make this choice. Absolutely. You know, when um, when you see in the popular press, when you see articles about living alone or being single, they'll say the 10 best things. And they'll say things like, well, you know, you can, you know, you can eat whatever you want, whenever yeah. you want, or, you know, all these kind of, which is true. Yeah, I, I have a little thing in my description is, you know, or just simply sleep in when right, you want to. Right, right, right. Yes. And all that is true. And all the little things like, you know, you don't have to be dressed when you're around the house and stuff like that. <laughs> you know, which I don't take advantage of, but, you know, but um, to me, it's the big things. Mm. So if I were married when I took this sabbatical, even to someone who was the most accommodating, gracious, etc. spouse in the world, I don't think I would have asked that person to do what I was totally willing to do by myself, to which take a was, big chance. yes, mm -hmm. I mean, I gave up a job with tenure, yeah, so a great job with tenure, to have nothing. <laughs> yeah, so so this, I mean, I, I have to emphasize that. Yeah. It, it's such a rarity mm -hmm. for someone to, to resign a tenured job yes. at an elite university. Right. Um, the, the, the two ways that it tends to happen yeah. is there's some scandal. Yeah, right. And it has to be a pretty big one. Right. Or... You've you've found some way to make oodles of money, right? You know, like you're right. a Wharton Business School professor, right. and you start to invest in businesses, yeah, and yeah, one yeah. of them pops, and you make uh -huh. fifty million dollars, right? And, you know, right. and then you're right. I don't want to deal with the faculty meeting. So, right. so what you did is, I mean, you know, but of course, like I think the thing is, you know, what what most of us really, really right. want is to live the life that we want to live. Absolutely. Yes. My critique of marriage has always been: I'm not anti-marriage. Mm -hmm. I am anti-choice. That is that I think marriage is over-prescribed. Right. That it's that it's pro it's right for some people and right. it's not right for some people. Yes. And there's almost nothing else in the world that is prescribed as yes strongly yes that's taste-based mm -hmm. as and, marriage. And it's so um, disappointing in a way that it's it's one of the rare. Issues on which the right and the left agree. Yes. Oh, interesting. Yes. So as, you know, a, someone who considers herself progressive, mm -hmm. it hurts me that progressives don't, aren't really uh, on my side. That's interesting. You know, I can't get much support from them. They'll, they'll still, you know, candidates still, my, my favorite, you know, that you can, you can get the most progressive candidate and they will still talk about how they're going to fight for families. Yes, I see. Working families. Yes, yes. Yeah. Well, and that's when single people are Democrats' best constituents. I mean, single people vote overwhelmingly for uh, for uh, Democrats. That's interesting. Single women more so yes, than, I see than that. single men. Yeah, and especially black single women. Of course. I mean, they should really be doing. They should be go go and washing their cars <laughs> and making them dinner. You know. <laughs> It's true. That's yeah. an important voting block. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit more about these myths. So I think right. talking okay. about that initial study yes. um, kicks off this idea. Right. And I think is really strong evidence mm -hmm. that the normal narrative that getting married makes you happy, mm -hmm. that there's no support for that. Right. There's a, as you said, a tiny blip around the wedding, but only but for the people who stay who married. Stay married. Yes. Those who are headed to divorce are already headed to less happiness on their wedding day. That's amazing. So, what are some of the other um, myths and findings that you that you've talked about? Well, the other one that goes along with that is that people who get married get healthier, mm. and in that respect, the studies are just getting better and better and better, including studies that go on for many many years. And in fact, one that came out just a few years ago uh, showed that in some ways, people who get married actually get a little less healthy. Okay. 
And um, I wrote an op-ed that the New York Times published. It said, get married, get happy? Maybe not. And so that, I thought, was a big breakthrough to get that core myth about marriage yes. punctured with some of the best data out there and get it published in the New York Times. Um, that's great. And what was the response that you had to that? Um, it was it was very popular. It made the most popular list for a long time. And, of course, the right wing just freaked out <laughs> and um, wrote critiques that appeared in right wing publications, um, which were very interesting because, of course, they do this right-wing thing of, oh, the evil New York Times, mm. and, you know, oh, they must not fact-check. And, and the truth was, it was fact-checked down to the detail where I had to tell them the exact line and the exact paragraph when I was describing because the study. Because they were so skeptical. Because they were, no, because they're... Oh, they're, they're the New York Times. I yes, see. they're conscientious. You, they do serious fact-checking. Mm -hmm. And then in the right-wing articles that critiqued me, they got all these things wrong, showing nobody fact-checked them. Yeah. And, but, you know, that was kind of predictable. Well, you know, one thing that I like about I mean, I feel that there is um, there's a lack of conversation around this. So the fact mm -hmm. is that your TEDx talk has yes. 900,000 right. views suggests that yeah. there are people out there searching yes. right. for information, approaching it with some open right. mind. And, yes. and, the, and frankly, there's, I don't think, a lot of good resources. Right. I think there is a real hunger for... Mm -hmm. Um, a script, a narrative about single people that is affirming. Yes. And what I do isn't just, oh, I like being single, so maybe you will too. I do research-based, or what the medical community calls evidence-based yes. um, writings. So I don't just say, oh, single life can be great. I show you the research. And in fact, there are new studies coming out now uh, recently showing that single people, contrary to the stereotypes, the stereotype says you get older, you get more and more miserable. Mm -hmm. These studies are showing, in fact, people who stay single become more and more satisfied with their mm. lives, which is different from people who are coupled who don't show the same yes. clear pattern. And that over time, historically, people who stay single are happier. So today's lifelong single people are happier than lifelong single people from two decades ago I or see. four decades ago. So I am um, in... in I'm going to venture a hypothesis, okay. and then I want you to tell me what you think of it. Okay. So I would say that what being single offers is the opportunity for growth. Yes. That pays off in the long run. Yes. Um, and and as a result, and also, yeah. you know, when you are a lifelong single person, yeah. you are prepared uh -huh. for for life, which yeah. especially end of life, where yes. your spouse right. may be gone. Right. And so, you know, everybody's like, oh, do you want to die alone? I'm like, listen, half of us die alone. <laughs> right. So let's, let's. The other half wish they were. <laughs> <laughs> so, so is that, is that part of, is that a hypothesis for um, that finding? That is an established result. Okay. That, um, a study. By the way, that I'm glad I don't have to do the research. I'm glad oh, you've okay. done it. <laughs> Right. And others so, have done it already. Yeah. So a study that looked at people who were married and people who had always been single over a five-year period mm -hmm. found that the lifelong single people experienced more personal development and personal growth. Mm. Um, and I think that there's a reason, which you alluded to, actually there are a lot of reasons why people who stay single for life, again, contrary to the stereotypes, do better than people who were previously married. So almost no matter what dimension you look at, happiness, health, whatever, it's the lifelong single people are doing um, better than the previously married. I see. And I think part of it is that the way we practice marriage now, it hasn't always been there that way, is pretty intensive. Yes. So, you know, it's considered romantic, not horrifying, that you look at your partner and say, you are my everything. Yes. And when people take those kinds of 
romantic notion seriously and they look to their partner to be their everything and they put their friends on their back burner or they ditch them and they put everybody else and everything else mm-hmm. aside if the marriage is going well that's fine you might it, it might be great it might be fine yes right, right. but you are putting yourself at great risk because once you get divorced or or even person. just you hit rocky spots yes, right which is right. like even i think even the steadiest of marriages right. have moments right that are yeah yeah you know illness right unemployment yeah or children conflict the cause yeah or just challenges. disagreements yes. you know growing apart or yes um what are you going to do when you've already you know ditched all your friends because they are. You you had your everything and your spouse. And in fact, there's research on that, too, showing that. Uh, so these studies ask people, you know, who do you go to when you're when you are happy and you want somebody to be happy with you, when you're angry, when you're mm-hmm. sad, when you're anxious. And they found that people who specialize, who go to different people for different things, are actually more satisfied with their lives. I'm that person. Yeah. I've got a person for everyone, yeah. everything, every situation. Yeah. yeah. But it's exactly the opposite uh. of the romantic narrative we've been sold that the epitome, the height of bliss, of the, true yeah. fulfillment is to have one person who is your everything. Mm-hmm. You complete me. <laughs> and that is supposed to be romantic. And that is scary. And I think, so that, to me, that's one of the, the um, myths that I, I like right. to attack, okay. which is the, this idea that single people are sort of lonely and isolated. Oh, right. And, and actually, you know, so, yeah. so you were talking about this affirming uh-huh. view of yeah, single yeah. life. To me, this podcast is designed right. for that, Great. right? It is, okay. it is okay. as positive a view. Yes. You know, it's, it's not yes. just that, that single life is okay. It's right. that single life is great. Yes. That it allows right. you to exactly. do remarkable things. Right. And I think that that idea that you can, that single people, at least the ones yeah. who are doing it well. Right. Have rich social connections. Exactly. They have a broader social right. network. Right. And, um, and it, and it, and that, can help with growth and it yes. also let's be honest it's a hedge yes. in a world where right. things don't right. always go well yes yes um single or married people have the one mm-hmm. single people have the, the ones. ones and that makes all the difference in fact um of all the different lines of research about single people and m- Scholarship is overwhelmingly about married people. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, tens of thousands of studies of married people. And single people are only there for comparison to make married people look good. But <laughs> they're the, the control group. Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> right. In this slowly emerging science of single people, one of the best established findings is that single people are better connected. They have more friends than mm-hmm. married people are. They stay more connected to people, they're more likely to um, stay in touch with them, to help them, to exchange help, to be there for them, to be confidenced. And this is true of their siblings, their parents, their neighbors, their colleagues, mm-hmm. their friends. And so in lots of ways, um, single people are not only not isolated, but they are on the average better connected. Yeah. Now, I think that there is a lesson in that yeah which is and i i kind of figured this out like on my own Mm -hmm. as a young man because i had some family difficulties okay and so normally as a young person also i'm a gen xer so family was you know parents were were adversaries unlike Uh, nowadays where parents are are, are, uh, um it's really different you know like very affiliative the uh they're they're your partners but um so I found that when I was very young, I, mm-hmm. I relied really heavily mm-hmm. on my friends right. for advice, for mm-hmm. knowledge, for guidance, yeah, right. and, and so on. And, so, and of course, what happens is you find that's really rewarding. Yes. And it's really useful. And yeah. so that has always been part of my repertoire as uh-huh. a single yeah. person because, you know, I moved to a new place. Mm-hmm. I'm not moving there with someone where you right. automatically have a partner. That's right. That, I, that it pushed me to... Yeah. To kind of spread out yeah. and, and seek out those people who are yeah. going to be not just people that I might yeah. want to date, but people yeah. that I just want to be sure to huh? be yeah. to be my friends. Right, right. Uh, it's there. Okay, so in terms, so okay, 
So these are big myths. Right. The data are very clear. Is there yeah. any, any other big myths that come to mind before we move on? Um, yes, that single people are selfish. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you for bringing right, that up. Right. Yes. Um, and, and they, and in fact, in everyday life, in the little exchanges of mm-hmm. small things, single people do more of that than married people do. Um, in formal volunteering, single people do more of every kind of Mm. Except religious stuff. Okay. Um, and the difference between single and married people in volunteering and doing work in, in, uh, religious organizations or churches is very big in that. And so when people say, oh, married people volunteer more, they're right in that one, in that in one. In religious domain. organizations. Okay. Um, and big things like being there for other people who need help uh-huh. on a long-term basis. Um, if you are, uh, an old parent about to need help, um, you better hope you have a single <laughs> child because whether you're black or white, whether your kid is male or female, they are more I, likely I, to I, be I there for my, you. I was my mom's primary yeah, caregiver at right. her, in her last years. Yes. And I had, the, you know, because one is I had the flexibility. Mm-hmm. There were other, there were other familial yeah. reasons, which I won't go into, right. but part of the reason I felt such a strong pull to do yeah. it was I had the resources right. and I had the flexibility yeah. as as a bachelor. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there are good and bad things about that. that. I mean, the good thing is some single people really like doing it and they're so grateful that they, they can do mm-hmm. it and they um, care about their parents and want to be there for them there for them um but the bad part is when people think oh you're single you don't have a life yes and what that misses is that when single people take time off from work to be there to help somebody else they don't have a backup income Uh, yeah so it's much more financially precarious mm -hmm. for single people to do this and yet they are the ones who do it you know, it's it's interesting that you bring this up because I was just thinking about this that I, in hindsight, regret not taking a family leave of absence. Uh-huh. That I continued to do my work and to, to to try to do it at a high level. Yeah. And the amount of discomfort that caused yeah. me. Yeah. And that I I just didn't even. I mean, it, yeah. but if I had had a child, I would right. have taken family oh, leave. Yeah, sure, sure. And um, I'm not suggesting that my caregiving was equal to that, but it was. Yeah. Yeah. It was a oh, it, it was a heavy lift. It it is, and, and so, it's psychologically. It was very difficult. Yeah, 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 and I think that's the difference between a child too. A child, you know, yeah. can be a lot of time work, but sometimes they're adorable. <laughs> 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 Which, you know, when you're taking care of a End of dying life stuff. parent, yeah, it's not so much. Yeah. So, um, I will tell you my thing, and this is related to the selfishness thing. Yeah. Is, I, it, it doesn't help that my name's Peter, but when. Um, uh, being referred to as a Peter Pan, oh. right? So the idea of like the man who will never grow right, up. Right, right. Um, so first of all, I'm, I just say, yeah. hold on. Yeah. We can't make marriage the standard right. of being a grown-up because I right. know a lot of immature people oh, who, are, absolutely. who are married. And the other one is, is point to anything else in my life that suggests that I'm right. not a grown-up right. in right. terms of... Yeah. The kinds of yeah. things that we're talking about, professional success right, and right. taking good care of myself. And- right. And in fact, I think you can make the case that in a lot of ways, people who are single are more mature. They're more the grown up because they are doing everything. Mm. They're not depending on somebody else to do half the work. You know, it's like, um, I think in Singled Out, I used to quip that married people are the ones on training wheels. That's funny. Yeah. I'm, um, <laughs> again, I think, you know, for me, I think the issue is there are just different paths to walk. Yeah. But I do think, I like, I just say, well, you know, you know, if you want to say I'm Pete, yeah. you're a Peter Pan because you're enjoying your life, I'm just right. like, well, you know. Yeah. When but, do we ever give married people demerits for enjoying their life? Yeah, that's right. And so the other one is, is that I think that, um, whether you're married or single, you're you're likely have some level of selfishness, which is if you ask people, why did you get married? They say, mm-hmm. well, because this person makes me happy. Yeah. And no one ever goes, that's really selfish <laughs> yeah, of you right. To, right. to drag this person along yeah. because they make you happy. Yeah. 
So let's um, let's talk about a, f- a few other things. Okay. So one of the things that I've been reading about is the demographic shifts oh, in huge. single living. So huge. So so while um, like if you're if you're 86 nowadays, uh-huh. like the likelihood mm-hmm. that you're married is incredibly high. That you were are or were married oh, is right. incredibly yes. high. But if you're 26, right. the probability that you're married or for some yes. or all of your life is not as high. In fact, uh, there was a Pew Research report that came out a few I years ago yeah. that showed that, that predicted that when today's young adults get to the age of 50, mm-hmm. one out of four of them will have been single their entire life. I, I mean, imagine that, a cohort of 50-year-olds in which 25% have never been married. That's fascinating. It's astonishing. Yeah, so that so yeah. those shifts, I think, suggest, yeah. as I was saying, you being yeah. on the leading edge of this, mm-hmm. that that what we're going to see as a result of that, yeah. when one in four, and by the way, yeah. When people are 50, that's yeah. when they have power. Yes. Right? They have buying yes. power. Right. They have political power. Yes. Right? They are someone to be right. paid attention to right. by governments right. and corporations and mm-hmm. so on. We should start to see some. I hope so. so at least, at the so. very least, I think we're going to see it on the consumer side right. of things. Right. Where the offerings in the world. Right. Right. Will be looking to. I mean, yeah, right. and you're already starting to see it, like in the travel industry. You'll find solo you know, trips, and right? So that on. do not charge the single supplement. I see. That's the key thing. That single people um, can. And the single get supplement in- is: I get a hotel room. It costs me two hundred dollars a night. Right. My friends who are married get a hotel room. It costs two hundred dollars a night. Right, which in some ways is understandable because it's it's the room. But some cruises and other travel packages. I see. Charge Get a discount, you more I see. than double, mm. and that's where you really have to start saying yeah. seriously. Now, now you use this term singleism, right? Did you invent right. that? Yes, term? I did. Oh, I did, and okay. it's comparable to racism, sexism. Yes, that's right. So, so to me, you know, so let's talk a little bit. So, so the demo, Are there mm-hmm. any other demographic changes that, that stand out to you? Uh, well, more people staying single. People staying single for more years of their lives, even if they do yeah. get married. And so that's, delaying marriage. That's because they're delaying marriage. And at the other end, people who get divorced or widowed remarry at lower rates I than see. they used. Okay. To. Uh, more people living alone because most single people actually don't live alone, but the proportion living alone has been growing for decades. Yes, that's right. I think so. especially among women. Um, well, certainly at later life, it's but, more. And, well, certainly later yeah, life, just because right, there's more, right, more right, women. But I yeah. think even young women, there's like more guys like in their parents' basement <laughs> than men. I know that. Like, <laughs> is that not true? I, uh, true. I, I, I should know this, but I definitely check. Fine. Okay. Um, so let's let's talk a little bit about these sort of opportunities, mm-hmm. right? So. So, I mean, we can agree that there are lots of stereotypes. Yeah. There's obviously people are stigmatized. And then, I mean, yeah. in terms of the isms, right, the, right. the, the discrimination's right. mild. Yeah. Um, oh, no. You don't think so? No. Do you think- oh, my gosh. Um, no, there are more than a thousand laws that benefit or protect you only if you are legally married. Oh, interesting. And that was... Among the many motivations for the people who work so hard to get same-sex li- marriage legalized, oh, I see, was all of this whole panoply of benefits to being yes, married. Yes, yes. Mm. In fact, the Edie Windsor case was about that—that that she wasn't, she didn't have access to the same benefits that she would have if she were um, legally married I see. in the United States. And they include things like Social Security. I can um, work side by side with a married colleague, same number of years, same productivity, mm-hmm. um, greater productivity. <laughs> and at the end, when my married colleague uh, dies, their benefits go Get to their spouse. On, but you can't Mine pass go them. into the system. And no one could give their benefits to me. I see. Or take something like um, family and medical leave act you can anyone married or single can take leave to care for um a parent or a child or themselves Mm -hmm. but a married person can also take leave to care for their spouse so yeah so what you're arguing i see what you're saying so 
the the cost of being single it's interesting the cost yeah. of being single is a missed benefit right rather than a penalty per se oh well there are penalties I mean, too i mean take uh, for example um Joan Del Torre had an article just published in the New England Journal of Medicine showing that doctors, oncologists mm -hmm. undertreat people who are single because they think they don't have the social support. That's amazing. And she got into this by her own personal experience of having cancer, a very deadly form of cancer. And her the first person she talked to wanted to give her a less potent treatment because he thought that without a spouse, she wouldn't be able to handle the effects of really strong chemo. That's fascinating. Yes. And again, that goes to what we are, we now know about single people. Mm -hmm. And she was a great example of that. She had great, uh, you know, she had cousins who cared about her, a great network of friends. Mm -hmm. um, and yet, when we are so obsessed with marriage and so persuaded that it's the married people who have social support and mm -hmm. the single people who don't, it can, it can have truly deadly consequences. If she didn't go to another oncologist who was willing to look beyond her marital status, yes, I um, see. she would probably be dead. Fascinating. Okay. I was wrong. <laughs> okay. No, but it's good. This stuff's good. Yeah. I mean, obviously, yeah. um, you know, much of my understanding about yeah. the, the work around this has mm -hmm. been reading your work. Okay. Because, you know, yeah. for a good reason. Okay. But let's, let's turn our attention to a little bit to, um, not the threats, but right. the opportunities. Yes. Because, because yes. right now the case that we're making yeah. is, <laughs> you know, like, oh, there's these benefits to being married, but let's talk about some of the benefits to being right. single. So right. we've already alluded to one, right. which is the, the freedom, right. the freedom of choice and the freedom to, Pursue the big things in your life that matter to you. Mm -hmm. I talked about it's not my just example, in. right? Yes, yes. Uh, or eating pizza for breakfast. You know, it's um, <laughs> yeah, it's the big things. And I actually uh, did for the Washington Post. I wrote an article in which I interviewed single people and said, "What did you get to do with your life mm. that you would not have been able to do, or probably would just wouldn't have done if you were married?" Mm -hmm. And they were big things like, you know, starting their own business or literally traveling the world yes. or um, changing careers. Or one person said, because I wasn't married, I was able to be there for my father in the waning years of his life. And yeah, that see. was such a great gift to me that I was able to be there. You know, I... um um Again, when I was sort of focused on the sort of male side of yeah. this a lot, you know, there's a lot of talk about the patriarchy yeah, and about yeah. the the systems that are, yeah. you know, that end up basically being oppressive to yeah. women. And the argument I make is that yeah. they're also oppressive to men. Yes, of course. And so, you know, the the cost to men of marriage mm -hmm. is an interesting one. Mm -hmm. That there's, you know, a subset of men who work themselves to death yeah. as the breadwinner. Right. You know, they go off into right. the military and they become right. police officers. Right. And they, you know what I mean? Yeah, and they, it's interesting. You know, and, and so one of the things that... You know, being single, to use kind mm -hmm. of finance terms, is you can lower your burn rate. Yeah. You know, so yeah. you can lower your expenses. Right. And when you lower your expenses, mm -hmm. then suddenly you can make decisions mm -hmm. that aren't always financially based. Right, right. You know, so not being uh, the right. caregiver to a primary caregiver oh, to a family. Right. Um, or in the case of, obviously, with women who tend to be yeah. the person raising kids more often yeah. than men, you know, the what you have to set aside to do yeah. that. And I think that single people are good at creative work and mm -hmm. scholarly, thoughtful work. There was um, an op-ed published somewhere, I forget where, by a philosopher who was making the case that many of the great philosophers were single all their life. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how that holds up if you did it systematically. Sure. Um, but I do think, oh, there is research on... That single people value meaningful work more than married people do. And it wasn't just comparing single and married people when they were fully grown adults. Uh -huh. But this study started when they were in high school. Interesting. And when they were in high school and no one was married yet, the people who would go on to stay single 
were already saying that they wanted work that was meaningful. Yes. And the people who were the students, high school students uh-huh. who would go on to be married, were already saying, I want to be paid a lot of money. Oh, <laughs> no? interesting. Yeah. Yeah. They, um, so is there a sense of what leads someone to live a single <clears throat> life? Um, I mean, I, you know, yeah, my own personal under- story has go been. Ahead. My own personal story, at least the narrative I tell, which is compelling, was, you know, my parents had an unhappy marriage and divorced and so on. So I never had role models. I never saw, I never saw all this positiveness. Yeah. And so the fact is that it just, it just always seemed like kind of a dubious claim that is blissful when I looked at these two people who had this relationship that was devastating to them. Right. See, my parents stayed married for 42 years, first and only marriage for both of them. I see. So you (laughs) Um, didn't have that. No, not at all. Um, I think that... There are people that I call, and I made up this name too, single at, single at heart. People who are single at heart live their best lives by living single. Mm. And it's not the dismissive, oh, being single is better than being in a bad relationship. Mm. No, being single is how you lead your most meaningful, authentic, rewarding, fulfilling life. I see. And... um I, this is what I'm most intensely studying now. In fact, I just, um, put out a lengthy questionnaire where I ask people to tell me about their lives as single at heart in the process of becoming some single at heart. And some of them know it from the beginning. You know, they, they kind of loved doing things by themselves when they were little. And some of them have stories where they wrote, they were asked to write a story when they were maybe in third grade saying, what are the, how do they envision their lives? Mm-hmm. And they'll say, I'm not going to get married. <laughs> You know, or, or they'll describe this whole life that doesn't involve marriage, even if they don't mention it. Um, but then other people, it's very hard not to get taken by the marriage narrative. It's so, it's so compelling. It's, it's everywhere. It's right. everywhere. And so, and it starts very young. Yeah. Yes. Right. With the With fairy Disney tales. And the oh thing. yeah. Yes. Oh yeah. And you know, right. And the things Even being ring bearers and yeah, weddings, right, and, right, it's and so relentless. On. Yes, um, and so it's hard to escape. So some people realize it when they get into a committed relationship or they get married and it ends, mm. and instead of feeling devastated, uh, they feel relieved. Yes, I see that. And then some of them try it again, and it takes them a few times to realize. I like my single life. Or they're in, this is my favorite example, is when they're in a relationship with someone they really do love. It's, you know, it's not like they ended up with a narcissist or some other horrible mm-hmm. thing, but they just uh, are fantasizing about being single again. Yeah. It's like, it's not that, it's not the spouse's fault. It's not marriage's fault. And there's nothing wrong with you for wanting that. Right. That's, I think, that's the, important the most thing. important thing. Right. Yeah. And that's the thing that they have to get by, thinking that there's something wrong with them. And in fact, um, even all these years after Single Out was published, I still hear from people who say, I've, I've been in therapy. I've, you know, I've done everything I could fit, do to try to figure out what's wrong with me for not wanting to be married. And now I realize, yes. yes. There's nothing wrong with right. you. Right. Yes. Right. That is why this podcast exists. Oh, right. Because I'm I think very that there are a lot of right. people. The issues right. are spread out. Uh huh. And what I hope to happen is the following, which is, when you live in a world where nearly everyone gets married, yeah. and even the people who don't get married feel tremendous pressure to right. get married, beyond just the benefits, yeah. it's, I don't think people get married to get the benefits. Yeah. They, they get married because it just seems like the thing right. that you do. Yeah. It's to try to get people to think differently about the opportunities. Right. That when, you, when you're released from that, mm-hmm. y- you have all this possibility. Yes. Yes. You know, you have more possible right. you have you have more possibilities about how you create your schedule. Yes. When you work, how what long you, you want to work, what you work on, yeah. where you work, where mm-hmm. you want to go and do yes. that that work. How much time you have to yourself. Exactly. And I think that those um but I it takes 
a realization. It takes yeah. someone giving you a little shake right. that says, hold on, you don't have to have the same beats right. to your day. You don't yes. have to have the same goals for your life. Yes. Um, your yes. development is different mm -hmm. because you don't have this mm -hmm. enormous mm -hmm. life change mm -hmm. that you either have to pursue, right. Right. that you're about to have, that you're right. in, or you're recovering from. Right. Um, you know, like, you know, my thing about it is, is the damage that divorce does. Oh, totally. Not only to your psyche, yeah. but to your finances, yes. to yes. your lifestyle, yeah. and so on. And I actually expect that there'll be a fair number of divorced people mm -hmm. who, who gravitate towards this project. Yes, yes. And, and actually, because what those people have done, which uh -huh. the average single person yeah. hasn't done, is yeah. they've lived on both sides. Right, right. And... Um, I can't, I'm always most taken by the stories of people who were once happily married, so often widows. Mm. And I'll talk to them and they'll say, I had a wonderful life, I had a wonderful spouse, and I would never do it again. Ah, fascinating. Yes. Right. Yes. So, um, let's talk about some resources. Okay. Right. So, obviously, yeah. your work is a good resource, <laughs> Thank you. Um, you yeah. know, in terms of understanding these things, especially because I do think that. That if you are, whether I like yeah. to say for now or forever, mm -hmm. committed right. to a solo living, right. it helps to have the ammunition yeah. by which to have reasoned right. conversations right. if you desire uh -huh. with people. Yeah. I mean, yeah. a lot of yeah. times I think sometimes I'm like, I don't, I don't want to have to go down that right. road. And other people, I'm like, you know what? Yeah. Let's talk about this for a right. little while. Exactly. Like, let's talk about how great it is on the other side because I don't okay. see it. You okay. know, like when I right. listen to my friends. Mm -hmm. talk yes it's yes. a lot like it's a lot you know what it is it's yeah. a lot like tenured professors yeah best job in the world then uh -huh. you talk to them and they complain yes. about a lot of the mm -hmm. things about it mm -hmm. and the issue of course is is like for some people it's great and for yeah. some people it's so so yeah. and for some yeah. people it's horrible but um but if you want to lean into those conversations right um and then also if you just want to be inspired right okay okay where do Several people things. look where should people look okay so um I have a list of books for the unapologetically single, okay. and that's at Medium. Oh, yes. So I don't have too many blog posts there, but one of them is 63 books for... 63 <laughs> books. books for, I, right. have, I guess I have a lot of reading to do. <laughs> okay. Yes. And then at my site today... Is, does one... does. Does one stand out to you? Like, have, have you read a book um, that you go, wow, that's... Well, in terms of social science, of course, my single out, as you already mentioned, is yeah. my personal favorite. But there's a new one by um, an author named Kislev, and mm. it's called Happy Singlehood. Okay. And it's based, it's again, the sort of thing I like in that it's based on tons of data. Mm. He does analyses of... Over 300,000 people from 30 European nations and shows all these ways in which single people are doing really well. Oh, that's great. So that's one. And then there's um, a more memoir cultural critique called No Thanks, Single Black. I forgot the the full subtitle, but okay. anyway, and her name is Katura Kendrick. And that is great because she is so unapologetically single and writes beautifully and, you know, takes no prisoners. So that is another one. So that's one. inspirational. Yeah. So that's another one. Okay. So that's one thing. Okay. Now, that's great. Talks. There are fewer talks, but at my living single blog at Psychology Today, I have a list of best TED Talks for the Unapologetically Single. Oh, good, good. It's, They're not all TED Talks, but kind of that. Uh -huh. um, for social justice themes, there is a group called Unmarried Equality. Okay. Um, and, that's, and that's on Facebook and online. Um, and if you just want to be in a community of people who are mostly all single and love their single lives or, you know, mostly do. Yeah, sure. Um, it's called the Community of Single People, and that's also a Facebook community. You have to apply to get in. But the main thing that we try to screen for is people who are there looking for a date. It is about every aspect of single life except dating. Yeah. So don't join the group if that's what you have in mind. But if you want to talk about all aspects of single life with people who are 
mostly embracing their single lives. Yeah, I mean, look, I think that in the same way that marriage is difficult, yeah. single yeah. single life yeah, can sure. be life is difficult. Right, right. The uh, you know that's one thing that I have been very clear is mm-hmm. that of course I'm going to talk about dating. Mm-hmm. It has, it's going to come up because okay. single people have the opportunity to date, <laughs> unlike married people. Yeah. But it's not about dating. This, Good. you know, it's it's Good. much, it's much, much yes. more. I've yes. got these experts lined up to talk about nutrition and yeah. talk about health and talk right. about finances and talk about art oh, good. and fashion and, oh, great. Okay. and travel and okay. so on. And oh, good. All, you know, yeah. all yeah, through yeah, the lens yeah, of the yeah. opportunity that you have. Well, I always say that I write about every aspect of single life except dating. But my most recent blog post at my Living Single blog at Psychology Today was about a study that showed that teenagers who don't date mm-hmm are more socially skilled, have better leadership abilities, and are less depressed than teenagers who do date. Which I just had to put out there because so often the teenagers who don't date are treated like, you know, they're they're kind of socially behind or they're misfits or something. And they're not. So let's talk about dating for a moment, (laughs) though, because I think it isn't, it's probably on people's mind. Like, you know, there's sort of two forms of being single. Yeah. Right, so there's the person who is single and and not dating, mm-hmm. and then there's the person who's single and dating. Right, and of course that may ebb and flow and so on. Right. But you know, the loose two categories. Yeah. Is there anything different about those folks, as far as you know? Oh my gosh, <laughs> um, the people who are dating in the sense of they're dating because they're afraid to be single. Mm. They are worse off in so many ways. You know, they will settle more for somebody who's not worth it. Uh-huh. They'll, um, th- they're just doing less well in a whole slew of ways. So being unafraid to be single is better than is puts you in a great place. But that's, you know, it's hard to say that in a way because it's not totally under your control. If you, you know, if you really want to be in a romantic relationship and you're not good at it, right, or whatever right. I mean, that, is. that can be yeah. painful. You know, we, you know, there's this whole world of these incels, right? right? Yeah. So these, yeah. And I, I kind of want to just shake these guys. Yeah. <laughs> because I mean, look, I actually feel bad for them. Yeah. I'm not, I'm, right. they, people tend to, um, cast aspersions right. on them in part because I you know there's been some violence with yeah. a few of them and so on. Yeah. But for the most part, I understand what it's like. It's called being a young man. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so like being a young man who wants to have sex mm-hmm. and wants to be appealing to women mm-hmm. and you're just because you're a young man and you just mm-hmm. don't have your, your act together. Yeah. You're not going to be. And, and the worst thing you can do is not lean in. Right. Right. So to me, the, the whole thing is, what I, I think that there's this very happy irony yeah. in approaching single life mm-hmm. from a positive viewpoint, yes. which is imagine this person who goes, you know what? I'm just not sure marriage is right for me. Mm-hmm. And yes, they date, but they mm-hmm. they lean into their career mm-hmm. and they yeah. travel right. and they go to right. museums and they pick up the yeah. guitar and they do, you know what I mean? Yeah, and they, yeah, yeah. they have a, a rich social oh, network absolutely. and so on. Absolutely. You, you know, guess what happens? Yeah. That person becomes an appealing partner. Yeah. You know, and so, so the person who's struggling with being single Uh and retreats Uh into video games Uh and pornography and, you know, these kinds of things is doubly painful. Right, right, right. Because it's obviously not a rich life. And then the other one is is that if they do actually want to be appealing. yeah. That's not the way to be appealing. Right. You know, there's and the if of you wanted a partner and you did what you said, which is, you know, lean into all the things that interest you about life, what yes. you care about, even if you don't end up partner, you still have a rich life. You have a rich life, right? You're, and, you, you win in, yeah. either, in either case. And I think the incel issue is in part, obviously not completely, in part it's a product of how we overly value marriage and ro- romantic mm-hmm. relationships. It's like we put this on a pedestal, pedestal above all else. I call it matrimania. Matrimania. <laughs> right. The over the top valuing and celebrating mm-hmm. of people who are married or weddings or couples. And it's not just, um, the married people, but it's the, you know, the over the top weddings. And now it's coming down to the pro- proposals even for prom <laughs> that yes. are, that are, 
out of control. And it just sends the message that the most important thing in your life, what makes you valuable, what makes you meaningful, what makes you worth celebrating is having a romantic partner. Yeah, I think that's, um, I think that's like super fascinating. You know, as I, as I kind of think about this, yeah. so I, you know, my own personal experiences have, you know, I've always been, I've always worked to be well-rounded, yeah, even when I was right. a graduate student. Yeah, which is hard to do because it's it's graduate really, school is so limiting. I mean, it's very focused. It is. and I, But I always, I worked hard at, yeah. at, at doing that, having a physical side to my mm-hmm. life. I played lacrosse and, mm. um, at a, and at a fairly high level. Mm-hmm. Um, it helped that I was sort of good at graduate school. Yeah, I right. was happy to work yeah, long yeah. hours otherwise. Yeah. But I, I have had this experience in life where I meet someone and we're sort of coupling up mm-hmm. in some way. And I know part of the reason we're coupling up is because I'm interesting you yeah, know, right. to this person because uh-huh. of the breadth of things that I yeah, do. Yeah. And then at some point, there starts to be some complaints. Huh. Which is, you know, you work yeah. a lot. Yeah, yeah. You're like, oh, you're traveling again? Yeah. You know, yeah. like, oh, you're right. going to go do that thing again? I'm like, yes, I'm going yeah. to do that. These are the things that I, I am. that I do. Yeah. I can't start shedding them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. To shed them to spend more time with you mm-hmm. didn't, it doesn't always feel right. Mm-hmm. You know, and so mm-hmm. um, that that's sort of the seed of this idea of the opportunities that you have. Right. right. So... Um, I think that you're living a remarkable life. <laughs> Thank so you. <laughs> not only are you an expert, but yeah. you know when I, um, I, you know I'm pleased by the risk that you took Thank 19 you. <laughs> years ago. Yeah. Um, I can appreciate it more than than most yeah. anyone. Yeah. Um, and your productivity, your creative productivity, is <laughs> it's extraordinary. <laughs> I'm, I'm really um, yeah. I'm envious of it. I don't. I don't have. I I know I don't have your writing chops. <laughs> I also have to sit in a lot more faculty meetings. Yeah, well, that's so makes, I'm doubly yeah cursed. Yeah, but you get to pursue interesting things. Yeah. In I mean, obviously, single life is interesting. Mm-hmm. But then you have a you've edited a book on Dexter. Oh yes, for example. <laughs> Right? Oh my gosh! Yes, I love that show. Oh my gosh! That I have to admit that wasn't my idea. So the um, somebody from the publishing house approached me and said, "You know, will you do this?" So, okay. So I did. But you but, did do it. Yeah, you I can do it, do it. Yeah, and you right. you could do it, right. and you did do right. it. Yeah. And so these are a series of essays about yes, by mostly by people trained in psychology, usually academic psychology, but some clinical psychologists, and interpreted various issues around uh, the show. It was just fascinating i just love that show yeah so that to me that's like a nice <laughs> right. example of yeah. um and i'm sure the phone calls you get and the yeah. opportunities oh, you yeah. get in life are it, it, it creates right. for a sort of rich intellectual it does. creative yes. Life. yes yes um yeah and i think a lot of what i do goes against the conventional wisdom and that's hard in a way, but it's also really uh, fulfilling when I can do it in a way that ca- that draws from research and draws from my training as a methodologist. So mm-hmm. I can say, okay, I know what you think that study showed, but let me tell you why it doesn't mean what the press releases and the headlines and the media are telling you that it says. And that's very fulfilling because what I discovered from all these years of not just doing academic research and scholarly writing, but more um, writing for broader audiences and just talking to so many single people is that these headlines based on research that to scholars are just another line on their vita. Oh, you know, married people live longer, mm-hmm. whatever their claim is. They are hurtful to real single people. And it's really- not just so, yeah, so I, I, you'll, I'll say it. You okay, won't say go it. Ahead. It's not just bad science, it's harmful science. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. Yeah, that's interesting. And I have found that over and over again. Um, so. It, it is fulfilling to get to push back on 
the harmful bad science with better science. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Yeah. You, you fight data with data. Right. So, you know, one of the things that you, um, so I always sort of talk about at the paper level is, you know, you want to have an original solution to an important problem. Mm -hmm. And then I think with a research program, mm -hmm. what you want is an original take on an important problem. Right. Right. So, yeah. So you, you clearly have that. Yeah. And then obviously this is as a result of not being on a college campus anymore. And then yeah. also given the nature of the work, it's, yeah. it sort of has pushed you into the, um, Kind of into the real world, right. into conversations with real right. people and with journalists yes, and so on. which has been really wonderful. And your reach is much broader mm -hmm. than just publishing mm -hmm. in these journals. Yes, and then I understand what it is that people are thinking about in mm -hmm. their everyday lives, you know, and it may not be something that the scholars are focused on. Indeed, yeah. yes. So, you know, this is just getting yeah. started. Right, right. So right. Th this, um, this is going to be, this might be the like first official, okay. You know the um, that right. I have, podcast episode that okay. I tape and, and and do. What advice do you have for me as I think about solo yeah. and I think about approaching this project? Yeah, um, with the goal of really trying to grow it and to have a, yeah. a community of people who are comfortable, mm -hmm. even unapologetic, <clears throat> mm -hmm. and it might inspire them yeah. to think in new ways and behave in new ways. I think do what you're doing. I mean, it is so refreshing to hear someone focus on what's affirming about single mm. life. Because what we've been missing is we have these whole narratives that are all focused on what's good about marriage and what's bad about being single. Yes. And what happens is when you get these studies, like the one I wrote about in the New York, New York Times a few years ago, showing that when people get married, they get less healthy. Yes. The scholars are stumped. They have a century of writings trying to insist that marriage is good for you. And and so they go, oh, you know, you have this person who's your support and blah, blah, blah. They don't have anything to show for explaining when the data are showing you something entirely different. Yes. All right. So you're saying double down on the positivity. Yeah, um, yes. Which is not to ignore the real challenges. There are challenges. Mm -hmm. Um, I feel like the challenges are, are getting addressed. Right, right. Except for the, the ones based on laws. Yes, that's true. Uh, and that, the singleism that's institutional, yes. that needs to be addressed because in a way, something, I mean, really remarkable about the studies of happiness and health that show that when people get married, they don't become lastingly happier and they become a little less healthy. How is that even possible mm -hmm. when they are advantaged in so many ways? They're respected and celebrated all the matrimonia. They get all the laws that benefit and protect them. And they can't translate that yes. into better health and happiness. What's wrong with them? <laughs> so um, I think it is really important to um, start asking about what it is that makes single life so fulfilling, yes, which is what what you're doing, but it is shockingly rare I think for the, people to do that. Yeah, you know, I, I'm going to give you my pet theory okay. about it. And this is, I, admittedly, I haven't done the, enough yeah. reading. Right. I certainly mm -hmm. haven't done any of the research on this. Yeah. Is that in some ways, single living is a, connected much more closely to our hunter-gatherer roots. Huh. Interesting. Than, than yeah. marriages. Yeah. Never thought about that. <laughs> so, you know, if you think about it, right, that, that you know, the, the rise of agriculture has led, you know, leads yeah. to this sort of nuclear family, um, <sighs> you know, and, no. and the idea of being in this hunter-gatherer, this sort of yeah. group of people, we'll see. That's okay. to be tackled at a later, <laughs> okay. at a later date. Yeah. Um, we're, we're just about out of time right. here. Right. Um, Bella, this has been a long time coming. I've yeah. been emailing you for okay. a long time about coming up the coast to, yeah. uh, to interview yeah. you. It's been exactly what I would oh, hope, great. Thank hope you. that it would be for. For the listener, I'm going to have all the exhibits and a bunch oh, of, the, okay. of the resources that, okay. we've, that we've talked about. Okay. And uh, what would be fun is at some you know, much later yeah. date to revisit some of the <laughs> okay. stuff and, and to talk about some of the themes that have all come right. up on this Sounds podcast. Good.
I'm always happy to come up to uh, this part of the okay, world. Okay, well, thank you. I appreciate it. Cheers. Thank you for listening to Solo, the single person's guide to a remarkable life. For more about our guests and show notes, go to petermcgraw.org. Please subscribe and share with your single friends.